Okay, welcome to the Project Finance Primer. The learning objectives are, what is project finance? Understand the differences between corporate finance and project finance, which leads us into characteristics of a project finance transaction. And finally, we complete the primer by talking about the key terminology that will come up time and time again. For example, what is a DSCR? What is a DSRA, a PPP? Get up to speed fast. Okay, so what is project finance? Well, at its most simple, we're financing large, long-term infrastructure projects. And we're financing them off the balance sheet with no recourse to the corporate, which means that debt that's been lent is paid back solely off the strength of project cash flows rather than any collateral assets. Why is this the case? Well, consider a toll road concession where the government grants a 30-year concession, but then takes over the toll road at the end of that 30 years. Well, it's critical that the cash flows in that 30-year period compensate the sponsor of the project for taking on the risk. Next, consider a wind farm, for example. At the end of a 25 or 30-year term, perhaps the SPV no longer has access to the land, and so they need to decommission the wind farm. So there's really no assets to speak of at the end of the project. And therefore, you'll see there's no terminal value. Let's discuss project versus corporate finance. And let's take a hypothetical corporate. It has existing assets, and those are financed through existing equity and debt. If it corporate finances a new project, i.e. it's on the balance sheet of the existing company, in determining whether to lend and continue to do business, Stakeholders, i.e. lenders, creditors, shareholders, will assess both the viability of the new project and the viability of the existing company. This is critical because if the project were to default, creditors could demand repayment from the cash flows of the existing business. As opposed to project finance, where there is separation between the existing company and the new project. So the assets of the project, or SPV, are ring-fenced and there's no recourse to the existing assets. Let's look at where project finance is advantageous. What happens if the project is large compared to the company's size? Well, any failure would contaminate the existing company, putting it at risk. So a key advantage is that a project finance structure protects the existing assets. And if the new project is more risky than the existing assets risk, this means that the cost of debt and cost of equity would likely go up, and therefore the combined WAC would likely go up, meaning that the existing company has a lower valuation. And coming back to WAC, we mean a weighted average cost of capital, so that's the average return that the stakeholders expect to get. So with that in mind, let's go through the project finance characteristics. We know that projects are financed off balance sheet, and we use a SPV special purpose vehicle in order to ring fence their cash flows. So a result of that is that there's non-recourse financing. If for example the project defaults, then creditors don't have any claim to a corporate's balance sheet. And because of this, this requires a well-developed risk sharing mechanism in order to get lenders on board with lending in the first place. So this requires a lot of technical analysis and certainty and contracts governing the relationship between all the different parties and very tightly specifying who meets which risk. Because of the level of due diligence and certainty required, this leads to extremely high transaction costs and a lengthy transaction process, which means that this typically only makes sense for larger projects. Unlike a corporate loan where financing is granted to a corporate and it can be used for generic purposes, there's not necessarily a direct correlation between the loan and how those funds are used. And therefore, corporate financing is typically a lot quicker to get. Now, a last characteristic is that there's typically a high level of debt. And this is due to the well-developed risk-sharing mechanism, as well as the ring-fenced cash flows of the project. Projects can get up to 90% geared if lenders have a high degree of certainty that they'll be able to get their debt service paid, from the cash flows of that project. For example, in an availability-based project, perhaps a hospital, in a nation where the sovereign risk is really, really low, i.e. the risk of the government or contracting authority defaulting is really low. 
Okay, so let's turn our focus to project finance terminology. These are the key terms that will come up again and again when you're going through a project finance deal. So let's cover them up front and you'll be better served for it. Starting with SPV, we've gone through this already. Special Purpose Vehicle. So that's the project company and it's a separate legal entity with no activity other than those connected with its borrowing. So it's not permitted to perform any function other than developing, constructing, operating the project. And this is critical because the lender has security over those cash flows arising from operating the asset. No other party has claimed those cash flows in seniority to the lender, with the exception of the tax authority and trade creditors. Public-private partnership. This is for projects involving both the government as the contracting authority and the private sector, and it's typically for large infrastructure projects that perform a public service. In this format, the government typically own the infrastructure. However, the project company own the right to the revenue for the concession period. And the private sector can perform many different roles within this, and I've listed a few of those there. CFADS, the cash flow available for debt service. This is arguably the most important cash flow in a project finance deal. This is the cash flows that senior lenders have claimed to, and their claim will be senior to the cash flow that flows to subordinated debt or to equity holders. And it's typically defined as the revenue, less expenses, plus or minus the networking capital adjustments, so that revenue minus expenses is now on a cash basis rather than a accrual basis, less the capex, less tax paid, is the CFADs. DSCR, the debt service coverage ratio. This is defined as the CFADs divided by the debt service, and it essentially measures the ability of the project to service its debt through the cash flow in a given period. It's the main measure for assessing a project's ability to repay its debt, and lenders want the project to demonstrate a cash cushion. Now, this is an in-period ratio as opposed to the LLCR. However, it's one of the most widely used. Now, from the difference between different projects, the more the project risk, the bigger the cash cushion is required and therefore the higher the DSCR. So I've compiled a table to give you an idea of the different types of projects and the average DSCRs that you might see. A regulated water asset will have a very steady revenue stream and therefore a low DSCR, while a merchant power plant, i.e. it has no offtake and it sells electricity at the spot price, will have a high revenue risk and therefore a very high average DSCR. Now keep in mind these are broad ranges and every project is different. However, this gives you an idea of how projects will vary based on risk. EPC, Engineering Procurement and Construction. This is a form of contract and it's a contractor who essentially designs and builds the project. The contract is a way of assigning the third party risk of constructing the project to the specifications. Now, from the EPC contractor's point of view, this is often mitigated by liquidator damages, which limits the EPC's liability, but more on this later. The offtaker. This is the counterparty that buys whatever the output is from the SPV. And generally the offtake contract will specify a long-term pricing formula for at which price it will buy that output. PPA, a power purchase agreement. This is an agreement which governs the purchase of electricity for projects that generate power, for example, wind farms or gas power plants. Now, more for power plants, it's broken into a fixed component, for example, the land rental, the debt service, and a variable component, the cost of fuel used to produce the energy, for example. So the fixed is the capacity charge and the variable is the energy charge. Contracting authority. In PPP deals, the contracting authority gives the SPV the right to construct the project and earn the revenues. And so the term contracting authority could mean any one of the central government or a regional or state government, a country, a municipality, or any other public agency. DSRA, debt service reserve account. This is a rainy day account. So it's a cash account held on the balance sheet of the project company, the SPV. And why does it exist? Well, the project relies on its cash flows in order to pay its debt service. And from a lender's perspective, to avoid one week period of cash flows, there needs to be a cash buffer, 
which is usually funded on construction. Now, bear in mind, this is all by negotiation. So the cash balance should be enough to cover a few periods of debt service, typically six months, but again, by negotiation. A P90 or P50, these refer to something called annual exceedance probabilities, and they apply to renewable energy projects, which rely on uncertain power sources like the wind or the sun. So a P90 means there's a 90% chance that the power plant will produce more than the specified amount of energy. And it's a very helpful statistical measure to help lenders get a degree of certainty over the revenues that the project will produce and therefore the cash flow that will be available to pay down the debt service. All right, so that's it on the terms and that's it on the primer. Let's now dive into the project finance simplified model and have a look at an airport case study.